thank you for having me here. Uh, it's actually my first time in Emory, uh, given we are neighbors. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's actually a privilege talking about something that, you know, comes from the heart. And uh, before I begin, put a few seconds into uh, the three words that stand in front of you. Robotic in nature. It's got two meanings to it. Think about it. I'll uh, touch base uh, after the talk. Robotic in nature. So uh, the dream began a few years back when uh, we were at Georgia Tech and uh, the Air Force had this amazing grant uh, to, to find and research these amazing new robots that can have covert applications. It was a defense project, but had innumerable opportunities for us to find inspiration from biology. How do insects, animals, birds get so small and be so smart? That was something of a challenge and also something of an opportunity. So we began off with thinking about what have we done over the years? Man and his machine. The aircrafts, the vehicles, the automobiles, the robots as you see them today, is some, are some, some of the few many innovations we've come up with over the years. Now that is all amazing, and, uh, but if you think about it, that's only about, what, four, maybe 500 years of evolution in robotic systems, maybe a few thousand years of evolution in, in machines, smart, intelligent machines. 4095 was when Leonardo da Vinci came up with the first sketch of a humanoid robot. That marks pretty much the beginning of our robotic era. Something on paper that looks like a humanoid, but is not a man. So, things we've already seen, all the way from the Wright brothers on the top left, to industrial robots which span pretty much the entire scale of a manufacturing industry to date. It's amazing how far we've come and how much there is still left to achieve. But if you look at the innovations, air, land, industry, and finally humanoid robots, it's, it's an amazing step. However, nature has had a 1.5 billion plus years of evolution. 1.5 billion years of evolution. 100 billion plus designs across its entire length of existence. That's, I would say that's some level of experience. <laughs> 400 years, 500 years of robotics, as opposed to 100 billion plus designs over 100, hundreds of millions of years. That's, that's, that's achievement, that's, that's experience. Life forms. What, what do we see when we see these life forms in air, land, water? Graceful, fast, in the most extreme of environments, sub-zero environments, and fluid and self-correcting, living by themselves, knowing what the environment looks like and reacting the best they can, it's evolution. It all came through the simplest of elements, Mic microbes came onto land and so on and so forth evolved into robots of nature. The perfect organisms that survive in the toughest of environments. We need clothes today, but penguins, they, they live sub-zero. So there's, there's something to it. And what we started doing was, at that point, was we, we really need to dig into this vast experience that Mother Nature already has. A billion plus years of evolution, there's gotta be something we can tap. It's almost like uh, juvenile fantasies of rebelling against parents that we uh, squander away a lot of our effort trying to make something possible, trying to learn, trying to make something possible, but all this give up on the experience that Mother Nature already has. So the talk here was to inspire an idea, hey, let's, let's take a step back. Let's think about what nature has already done, and let's learn from nature. Let's cut a few corners along the way. Why do we have to redo everything that took a billion years to evolve? Let's pick up pace. So we started off back in the days trying to 
don't take this, uh, this uh, theory, hey, let's learn from nature, let's take it a step beyond. Let's research what fabrics look like. Simplest of things. Fabrics are found in insects. We wear fabrics uh, all day, every day. And if you look at the simplest of fabrics as in the, uh, the wings of dragonflies, all the insects, per se, made of silk. Silk stands at about 1,000. It's about 10 times as strong as steel. The strongest steel that man has ever made, silk to date still remains 10 times as strong in tensile strength. Now that is achievement, that is technology developed by nature, and we, we, we try to harness it. So if you look at the, uh, the videos on top, those were our experiments in trying to recreate some of the fabrics in nature. Let's try to make them ourselves. Let's see what it takes to actually get there. De it took days and, and weeks to try to see if we can come up with something that can, that can be as powerful as something as simple as a, a wing on an insect. So you can imagine how much we can learn from nature. Robotic in nature. It's, uh, it, it's, it's almost like uh, we have robots living with us. They're even flying out here, microbes that live on our bodies inside our cells. And there's an opportunity for us to learn from them the evolution that they've, they've had over the, these hundreds of millions and billions of years. And the mission for us began at that point was to start exploring how can we learn and mimic biology to, to the point of actually trying to get near the efficiencies that nature has already achieved. Nature is minimalistic. There's nothing that goes to waste in nature. There's nothing that's, that's there that's not needed. It's optimal, it's efficient. Let's try to get there, let's see what happens. So our, our challenge began back in the days when the Air Force uh, funded the research. We came up with an idea to try to create this biologically inspired device that, that's, that's as fast as the fastest possible as the most strong flyer in nature, the dragonflies. What will it take for us to build something as smart and small and fast and agile as the nature's falcons in the insect world? Took a lot of research, but it's amazing to see what nature has already achieved. The dragonfly on the top left, simplest of constructions, any insect for, for that matter, but the dragonfly being the strongest, simplest design out in nature, four rings, and here's a homework for you. If you go back home today, or any time you can, try to find a dragonfly, and if it's flying out in the garden, see how long it flies. You'd be amazed that the fact that the dragonfly would not stop at, till the point you, you give up. That's, that's, that's a huge feat. It's energy stored in such a small factor, form factor, it it's blows our mind away. So what we did was, thought about ideas. Let's, let's come down to the basics. What does the dragonfly need to attain that much energy efficiency? Energy is a big deal right now. If you look at cars, we are at minimal efficiency. We are always racing for gas. What if you could do 100,000 miles with one tank of gas? What if you could do 100,000 miles running by yourself with energy stored in your body, as the insects have? It's all about efficiency and being minimal while being optimal. So let's, let's think about what do we do? So our work started off with learning about nature and how dragonflies fly in nature. You see the grace, the form, the brilliance of design. It's, it's fluid on the left. And we try to do some research on developing a bio-inspired robot that does about the same and achieves nearly about the same as what a dragonfly can do. If you look at the, uh, the wings, the motions, how they fly, it, it struck to us that we may be onto something, that biology indeed has a, an element that we've, we've missed. We should capture this. This is a, a step back, uh, almost like a pivot in the development cycle. We've been caught in this local minima or local maxima. We can escape from it and try to find this global maximal efficiency that, that, that is almost in every living organism. So, with that in mind, we developed the first dragonflies. Try to capture 
the grace, the form, the efficiencies of these uh, robotic systems. And that video is, uh, is by a high-speed camera that's, uh, that's wing-flapping at about 20 to 30 times a second. So it's, uh, it's uh, an engineering marvel that took a lot of research and design from a lot of bright people uh, working at Georgia Tech, funded by Air Force, a lot of different, different people, including our work at TechJect. So it's, it's a step we took forward, and we believed, yes, I, we feel this is the way to going forward it, with leaps and bounds and learning from what nature has already learned, the experience of Mother Nature as it stands. With that, we began off doing more research. We thought, what does it take for an insect or a lizard or even your cats and dogs? They're simple organisms, they're simple animals. What does it take for them to survive? They're smart, intelligent, they live out by themselves in the wild, they eat, they survive, they're efficient, they're the ideal for their surroundings. But it's all about the brain. So let's take a step back and think about what it takes for an insect or a small lizard to achieve what it does by itself in, in nature. And with that, we, we looked at some of the designs in nature. Eyes are the biggest, the, the strongest gift we have. The, the power of sight is one of the, the greatest gifts uh, endowed to us and came through evolution. But look at the lizards, the insects, they all have eyes. Simple little organisms that will escape you even if you try to run after them, that are fast enough to find their food and that are slow enough that you won't even see them because of optical flow sensors, our, our eyes not adept to finding motion as well as some of these insects. It's, it's amazing to look at nature. So what we thought was, well, if, if we can capture that brain, that little brain that, that resides in that little skull that's the size of a, a, match, a head of a matchstick, if we can capture that little brain, what would happen? We would have the power to endure robots with the same reactions, reaction times, the same efficiencies, the same, same level of uh, caliber as some of these amazing insects out in nature. So we started off developing some of our own. Let's think about eyes and the brain. Let's think about these small little creatures. Let's get inspired from biology. The, the, uh, the lizard on the top left, a chameleon. And uh, we try to capture some of these eyes as they stand on each side. Uh, and then looked at some of the, the other birds, the eagles, the falcons, they have eyes pointing forward. It was amazing to us to see that it's a simple little construction. What if we can build these tiny brains with eyes and take them forward to develop robots? So we started off uh, building these, uh, these little brain boxes, as we call them. They're robotic brain boxes endured on, uh, on little robots. And as you've already seen, there's a whole bunch of these robots flying out in uh, uh, all around us. They're off the shelf on Amazon. You can buy them and so on. So we thought maybe these robot brains have something to it. What if these, these robots that we fly today, what if things that we wear, things that we carry, could be endured with these tiny little smart brains by themselves? Eyes and computing, brains, cerebrum, cerebellum, uh, balancing, all these things endured in something so small that can be put inside a tiny little robot. You could probably make a virtual lizard for yourself or a dragonfly, for that, for that matter. With that in mind, what we felt was, indeed, there is, there is something to, to uh, learning from nature. It's all about the experience. Let's tap into this experience, but with a twist. The twist is nature gave us the brains to think around it as well, which is, which is a huge gift. Let's, let's defy nature. Let's, let's go a little beyond what nature has been able to think. So with that in mind, we started defying some of the conventional ideas with uh, an evolutionary step, as we like to call it, to come up with new ideas that are inspired and a blend of different, different organisms and, and, uh, and uh, animals and birds. Some of the, you can see these graceful animals, the squirrel on the top right, that's a flying squirrel, and uh, the, uh, the flying fish, and then you also have the flying lizard. We don't, we don't have the flying lizard in the Air Force. We, 
the army doesn't make flying lizards, what, what gives? What, what, where do we lose on the evolution cycle? So we, we started going forward and coming up with ideas of how we can use biology to capture something in robotics. A flying manta. Have you heard of a flying manta? Probably not, because it's, uh, it's, it's a deep water creature that doesn't fly. What if evolution did have a twist in there that had the flying manta fly? What would it look like? What would it do? What if we had a flying fish? Have you seen a flying fish outside of water? What if we did? What if we had something graceful and magnificent that doesn't really come from nature, maybe a spin-off from nature, but naturistic nonetheless? Folding wings, more graceful. What if we made a Batmobile? <laughs> something that looks like a bat, walks like a bat, So these are ideas that we thought are unconventional and defy, defy nature's stance on, on evolution, but still keeping a good, hard uh, pivot on, on nature's uh, achievements, its experience. It's an idea for us to capture nature and take it forward towards some of these amazing, beautiful creations which do not yet exist, but at the same time trying to optimize and make, be more efficient in what we do. Morphing, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the most graceful things that we've seen in nature. Imagine a bird tucked away, perching on a branch, and it lunges itself forward, out comes the, come the wings, and it flies sky high. Cars are coming up with those ideas. Biology is, uh, is inspiring design. Morphing is, uh, is a huge, huge catchphrase at the moment. Morph, morphing wings, morphing cars, morphing morphing vehicles, morphing airplanes, it's, it's a catchword, buzzword. Nature is minimalistic. There is nothing in nature that is in excess. If, you, if, if it exists, it has a meaning, it has a purpose. But our designs are what? Mortar, uh, cement, bricks, wood. We overdo things in life. We overdo things because they're simple, they're quick. But at the same time, we forget that efficiency has already been achieved by nature. Let's learn from it. Smart structures, all the way from insects to trees to branches. We can use them and evolve ourselves, evolve our designs. Patents in nature, beautiful. They have a meaning and they have a purpose. Why can't we use them? Bioform, fish, animals, birds, insects. It's amazing to see that they have something unique, but it's not just a form, it has function. How can we blend bioform and function together to form a unified and amazing new creation? That's the, the idea we want to spread. Smart sensing, like we just saw with the brain boxes, our attempt to capture the, the smart sensing of uh, animals. What if we can capture smart sensors that are already out there in insects, in small bees, in birds, to avoid cars as we walk through the, through the, uh, through the, uh, the walkway, to avoid obstacles? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of development that we can achieve only if we capture the, uh, the experience of nature. And at the end, nature is the most beautiful designer that we have. Uh, there's nothing that human beings have been inspired or have done that does not include inspiration from nature. Graceful, functional, and beautiful. That's the power and the experience that comes with nature. That's pretty much my talk today.